Little Britches, Father and I Were Ranchers. Chapter 1, Continued. A narrow-gauge spur of the Colorado and Southern left the main line at Petersburg Junction, then followed Bear Creek to Fort Logan, where it climbed to the tableland and ran west to Morrison. It was a single-track line and crossed the center of our ranch. There were no passenger trains, but one freight each day had a passenger car hooked on the end of it. We were all down at the depot early Saturday morning, and Father asked the conductor if they would stop the train so we could get off on our own place. As we were climbing down, the engineer blew three sharp toots on his whistle, and we all looked toward where he was pointing at something on the track ahead. A quarter mile west, there was a deep gulch where, after storms, Water from the hills had cut the land away in running off to the creek. The railway crossed it on a high trestle, and something that looked to me like a big black whale was floundering around in the middle of it. Father ran toward the front of the train, and I ran after him. The engineer cupped his hands around his mouth and shouted, Horse through trestle! Is it yours? Father motioned for Mother to go to the house as he swung up on the engine. But he could run so much faster than I that the train started moving when I was at the back end of the first boxcar. After going everywhere Father had for the last couple of weeks, I didn't want to be left behind then, so I grabbed hold of the foot rods and pulled myself up. I heard Mother scream, Ralph! But I held on tight, and the train didn't stop till it got to the trestle. Nig's four legs were down between the cross ties, and he was thrashing around like crazy. The first thing I wanted to do when I saw him was run for home, but I couldn't pull my eyes away. His hind end was toward us, and there were big, bloody patches on his thighs. He was out nearly 20 feet on the trestle. Between him and us, there was more blood on the cross ties and big clumps of white hair. I knew Bill had been in there too, but he was nowhere in sight. I peeked down into the gulch, and there he was, stretched out on a little patch of snow near the bottom. The snow was half covered with dust and tumbleweeds, and big blotches of bright red blood showed between them. Nig would thrash and jump until he was all tired out, trying to pull his legs up from between the ties. Then he'd fall back and pound his head against the track. I was sure he was going to kill himself any minute. All the men from the train came running up to the trestle, but Father was the only one who seemed to know what to do. There was a sign on a four-by-four post beside the track, right near the end of the bridge. Father wrenched it out of the ground, smashed the sign off, and ran out on the trestle toward Nig. I didn't want to see Father kill him, so I covered my eyes with my hands. There was a hollow thud, like a wooden tub hit with a stick. Then I dropped my hands. Nig was lying perfectly still. Father called to the men standing at the end of the trestle. His voice wasn't quiet then, as it usually was, but he didn't yell. It was big and deep, like the ring of a church bell. Bring chains and anything you can pry with, he called. We'll have to hurry a bit. He'll come around in two or three minutes. All the men started running around like ants when you plow into their nest. In another minute, they were swarming out onto the bridge. They were all chattering like magpies, and some of them were yelling. Father's voice rang through the hubbub, deep and strong. Run that chain under here. Take a pry across the top of that rail. Here, big fellow, heave up on his head. Wait for the word. He sounded the way I'd always imagined George Washington must have, and I was proud he was my father. I saw him crouch with his back against Nig's hind end. He pulled the long tail over his shoulder and cried, Up! Nig's legs came up through the ties with a rush. He must have come to at the very second they got him up. He thrashed, and the men jumped away from him. In another second, he toppled over the side of the trestle. 
There was a dull thud when he landed. It was then I realized that my pants were wet. Father vaulted over the side of the trestle near our end and disappeared into the gulch. I didn't dare to look down. In a minute or two, his voice came up. No broken legs, and they're breathing well. I think they'll make it out all right. Thanks. The trainman didn't seem to care about anything except having the track clear. The engineer climbed back on the engine and tooted the whistle. In another minute, the train was gone, and I was left all alone. Father came up over the edge of the gulch and picked me up. He didn't mention my pants, but unbuttoned his reefer and wrapped me inside it. I'm sorry you had to see it, son, he said, but it's the sort of thing that makes a fellow into a man. We'll go get some bandages and see what can be done for them. Carrying me to the house, he said, sometimes these things seem awful hard to take, but maybe they all happen for the best. Now you children will know that the bridge is dangerous. It might have been one of you that fell off of it. After that, he pointed out a jackrabbit that was scurrying away along the track to a single, stunted cottonwood tree near the far end of our land. There, he said, who says we haven't got a woodlot on our place? Perhaps with enough irrigation water, it will grow into a fine, big tree. It would have been nice if they put the house by the tree, wouldn't it? When father brought me into the house, Mother had a fire going in the cook stove, and everybody was standing by it, getting warm. She looked up at Father, and her underlip was trembling. Are they both dead, Charlie? she asked. No, Father said. They're both living. I don't know how badly they're hurt, but they don't seem to have any broken bones. He didn't unwrap his coat from around me, but whispered to Mother. Then we went into the front room where the trunks were, and she closed the door. They were the only ones who ever found out about my pants, and it never happened again. While Mother ripped an old sheet into bandages, Father went out to look around the barn. When he came back, he said, Coyotes must have closed in and frightened him about daylight. There's plenty of sign. What have you got for antiseptic? Mother put her hand up to her mouth. I don't think there's a thing here except a couple of bichloride tablets. Never mind, Father said. Ralph, you bring the bandages. I've got a can of axle grease in the wagon. I hadn't expected him to take me with him after my accident, and I pulled my coat on as fast as I could. I was afraid both horses might die before we could get back and wanted Father to run, but he wouldn't. You could ask him all the questions you wanted to. He never got cross. So I said, why didn't it kill Nig to pound his head on the tracks? Do you think Bill pounded his head too? Father, how did Bill get out when Nig couldn't? Well, Father said, Nig hadn't been in there long enough to do himself much damage. The blood was all fresh and bright, so they must have fallen in less than 15 minutes before we got there. Nig pounded his head because he was frantic. Bill had no reason to do so because... He could get out. From the marks on the track, I'm sure that one of his hind legs didn't go through at all, and that he braced himself with his head to pull his front legs out. I'll show you when we get there. Father whistled when we got near the end of the gulch. He was so much taller than I that he could see down into it sooner. I ran to the edge. Bill and Nig were cropping grass around a wet spot. Nig was limping. But Bill didn't seem to mind the blood that was oozing from torn places on his thigh and forelegs. As soon as Father saw that the horses were up on their feet, he went over to the trestle. He picked me up after looking up and down the track, walked out on the bridge. Then he scooched down and showed me all the marks on the cross ties. Almost everything that happens leaves its telltale marks, he said. If you teach yourself to see all the marks... You can always read the story. Then he had me wait while he went down into the gulch and led the horses out. He said that since they were on their feet, we could do a better job of dressing them at the house. Mother came out to help with the horses when we got back. 
She was always good when there was sickness. She took scissors and started clipping hair from around the torn places on Nig's four legs. I'm worried about this one, Charlie, she said. He must be badly hurt to limp so. Father was poking his fist up against Bill's belly. I'm not worried much about him, he said, but I'm afraid this one may be done for. I don't like the way he's drawn up in the loin. And we'll continue with Chapter 2 next time. Until then, as Tigger says, ta-ta for now. Thanks so much for watching. Love you guys. Bye-bye.